like usual. So here we go. Okay, let's begin with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, this time we give you thanks that we can gather around your word. Even if our gathering is at home and watching on a screen or listening in our phones or our iPads, we thank you that your word comes to us and through that word, your spirit comes to give us faith, to point us to our Savior, Jesus, and to give us hope in the sure promises that you are with us always, even in this. Lord, we ask you in this time together that you would guide our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit, that as we read these words of John, we would see our Savior, Jesus, trust in him, and learn to live according to your will for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, here we are in John 7. I know it's been a couple weeks, but if you remember, we are, the, well, I should ask, does anyone remember where we are as far as the setting goes? What, what festivals were our feast? What's the feast that we're, we're in the middle of in John 7? Festival of the Booths or Tabernacles. Good, excellent. So the feast or festival, right, same word, of booths or tabernacles. Okay, and remember, this is one of the three most important feasts of the Jewish calendar, right, where you have to go to Jerusalem. So you have, you have these three major feasts, and this one, this one celebrates that during the 40 years of, of wandering in the wilderness, they lived in temporary shelters. So it's a festival to remember the 40 years of wandering, but also to remember and to celebrate that they got to the promised land, right? That God kept his promises of getting them to the promised land. And this is, um, this is a big deal. So what would happen, remember, is everyone would go to Jerusalem and they would put up these, these temporary shelters either in Jerusalem or outside of Jerusalem, and they would live there for a week and they would eat different food and they would celebrate. And, and then at the, in the middle of the, fit, middle of the feast, there is the celebration of the pouring out of the water. So there's a big water festival in the middle of the feast. Where they have, and they would, they would actually pour water on the altar. And, and then at the end, the very last day of the festival, there's a festival of lights. Okay. And they would stay up all night and the gi these giant torches we put up so that we could stay up all night and celebrate. So you, in the Feast of Booths, you have these two major portions, the Festival of Water and the Festival of Lights. And what we're gonna see in John 7, right? John 7, 37, we'll get there today maybe if we, if we go fast enough, you know how it goes. Um, but in John 7, 37 and following, he's gonna talk about how springs of living water, right? Springs of living water flow when he gives the Holy Spirit. And then in John 8, 12 and following, Jesus is going to say, I am the light of the world. Okay? So you have these, these two ideas of the Feast of the Booths in Jesus. And remember, whenever you read about festivals or feasts or holy days of the Old Testament, what we're really wanting, you guys got all that? This is the problem, my board's not very big. What we're really wanting to remember is that all of these feasts, all of the things of the Old Testament are fulfilled through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So his death and resurrection is actually the point of the Feast of Booths. Okay, remember, Jesus in John 1, 14, Jesus is the word that is made flesh, and that made flesh word is the word for tabernacle. He's the word that's made flesh and dwells among us, okay? So that's, that's what this whole, sorry, I'm trying to do something on my computer. Okay, that's what this whole idea is about, is that Jesus is a fulfillment of the Feast of the Tabernacles, okay? Any questions? That was kind of reviewed from last week or two weeks ago. Anybody have any questions? No. There you go. Um, 
Okay, if you think of something, just shout it out and we'll, we'll do our best to get to it. Let's look at our sheet. So we're going to read John chapter 7, verses 25 through 31. So John 7, verses 25 through 31. The principle. I think it's probably best if I read. I would like you guys to read, but I don't know how that's going to work. So let's, let's, I'll read it. I'll do my best to read. John 7, 25 to 31. Some of the people of Jerusalem this was said, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And he, here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know. Oh, yeah. Did you see my teacher, Mrs. Mrs. Eggle? No, that's my that's you the know principal. me, and you know where I come from. But I have not come from Here he is again. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he <laughs> said. Yeah. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Okay, so number one. What authority do the people recognize? What authority do people recognize? The Jewish leaders. Okay, good. You have the Jewish leaders. And they're kind of wondering what these people are thinking about Jesus, right? So one of the big issues in the Gospel of John, and, and as you guys know, in the other Gospels, and it's doing something to fix my computer, I don't know what, um, is that, but this is especially true in the Gospel of John, the Jews, okay? The Jews, the leading people of the Jewish, what would you say, the Jewish religion or the Jewish um, gathering in Rome. So the, the Jews, um, they have authority. So they have political authority. They actually run um, the law. They have religious authority because the Pharisees go around teaching doctrine. And they also have kind of, would you say, um, cultural authority. So they kind of tell people how to live as Jews in the culture, uh, making ethical and moral decisions. So people recognize this authority. What other authority do they recognize? Oh, Anna, did you make it worse? No, no, I fixed it and then I did, I fixed it again. Oh, no. What are you trying to fix? I'll fix it. All right. So. They recognize the Jewish authority, but they also recognize their own. Okay, do you see what they say? They quickly go from, I wonder what they think, and then they say, but we know certain things. Okay, and... Got it. Did you get it? Yeah. Hi, Jim and Colette, I didn't see you there. Okay, so they also recognize their own authority. So they say, they, they kind of wonder what, the Jews are the authority of the Jews are letting them speak, but then they go quickly to, but we know things, and what we know or what we think we know doesn't line up, and therefore things can't be. And this is important is they're gonna say, Well, Jesus can't be Messiah, right? And remember, that's the same word as Christ, because he's not living up to what we think he ought to be. And this is a big issue. In the New Testament, especially in the Synoptic Gospels, in, or in, in all four Gospels, is that Jesus can't be the Messiah because he's not living up to what we think Messiah should be. And ultimately, obviously, they kill him over this. But I just wanted to pause for a second in our world and kind of remind us that we are prone to the same thing. We have, we have decided that certain people have authority over us, and we trust them. But then also... We often think, well, I kind of got all this figured out. And, you know, God kind of needs to live up to my understanding of what he should do. 
you know, um, and, and we've talked about this a lot before in class, but, but the whole idea of if God is a loving God, how could he do this? Or, you know, I, there's no way God could do that. Or there's, or there's no way that God should. And we start telling God what to do. And the whole idea is that, you know, we think we've got all this figured out. We think we know. And therefore, we have the right to tell God or to um, blame him of things. Remember, this whole idea that our own idea of God is something God has to answer to, this is the point of the book Habakkuk. Remember, there's three Ks, two A's, a B, an H, and a U. Habakkuk. The whole point of the book of Habakkuk is that it, it twice Habakkuk says to God, you're not living up to the way I think you ought to be God. And in both times, God answers Habakkuk and says, I will, I will reveal to you why I'm doing what I'm doing, and you don't have the right to question me. And this is part of understanding all this, is that Jesus doesn't show up in order to be the Messiah that people want him to be or expect him to be. He shows up to do, may remember? What does he keep saying? God's works, or God's will. Yeah, good, God's works. God's, right? And he's going to say, the will of the one who sent me. Okay, and this becomes the proof that Jesus is Messiah, is he's going to do the will of the one who sent him. He's not going to do his own will. He's not going to do the people's will. He's not going to even submit to the authority's will. He's going to submit only to the will of the one who sent him. Okay, does that make sense? All right, number two. So who is really in control? God, the one who sent him. Good. But in this story, who's really in control? I mean, yeah, obviously God's always in control, but who's running the show in this little in this little story? So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. See, all the authorities, all the people, they have their ideas, but the one who's really determining what's happening at this time is, is Jesus. And he's saying, it's not time for my cross yet. It's not time for you to die yet. So they can't arrest him. They can't obviously kill him because it's not his time yet. And this is one of those things that just can, continues to rehearse throughout the gospel is that everybody gets, can have their own, own opinion. They can even try to do certain things. But in the end, Jesus is the one who's actually running the show. And it's it's the determination of his death and resurrection according to the Father's will of when and how that's going to happen that actually end up shaping the narrative. And the reason this is important for you and me is not just to remember Jesus is God again, but to remember that this is still going on, that you might not perceive this, you might not even believe this, because it's hard to figure out, hard to see, is that everything that's happening everything in, in the history of the world it's all because it's all in line with the narrative of god sending his son jesus to rescue sinners right this is this is the narrative this is the entire narrative of history and what happens is we get so caught up in what's happening in our world that we're distracted from this and what the scriptures continually do is say, look, from creation all the way through until the end of time when Christ will return, this is the narrative. God sending his son, Jesus, to save sinners. Okay? And you guys know this. You guys know this very well. First Timothy chapter 2. This is good and pleases God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Right? Second Peter chapter three, God is not slow in keeping the promise of the second coming, but he's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance, right? You guys know this 
We all know this. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. What's the program? God sends his son that who, so whoever so believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So what that means is that the point of this whole narrative is life. And, and this is why we can always rejoice in God, no matter what befalls us, because we know that the one who's running the show, the one who's in charge of all this, everything he's doing is eventually to give us life. And that life is eternal, right? Don't be confused. It's not earthly. It's not healthy, wealthy, and wise. It's eternal life. And that eternal life is accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Okay? So that's actually what Jesus is getting them to do. Well, we'll get them to understand as the gospel unfolds. But this is the whole movement. Is there, They're kind of looking at Messiah, which is kind of part of this, but they're not understanding how. And they're saying, you can't be this, you can't be that. And, he's, and Jesus is pushing them to a larger reality. Okay? Any questions before we move on? Hey, Kevin. Yeah. I just think it's so comforting what you just said, because so many times in life, things don't turn out like we thought they would, or, you know, if only this, then this, but we take comfort that God works all for good and, and that he aims for life. And that, that's, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. And so that's the other verse, right? That's the other one we didn't write up there. Romans eight twenty eight. all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Uh, the epistle lesson for today it doesn't get that far, but it's from Romans 8, right? And that's, that's really the whole point of Romans 8 is to, is, to, is to continue to give us that hope and comfort. Good. Very good. Anything else? Okay. I think we're going to be a little too fast, but that, that, that happens. So number three, why can't Jesus be the Messiah? What do they say? Because they know where he's from? Yeah, they know where he's from. And, and this is really weird. Like, you can read a bunch of stuff on this, and everybody's like, I don't know what they're saying. There, so there's basically two ideas that might be informing this. One is that they thought the Messiah would, would kind of be this mysterious figure that no one really could understand. And the other one was, which the second one I think is more probable, is that there actually was a messianic idea going around that he would just all of a sudden appear on the scene as kind of an anonymous person and accomplish the salvation of God's people and then disappear again. And remember, salvation was not eternal life in their minds. It was getting them out of the oppression of the Romans or whatever powers happened to be in power at the time. So um, it seems like what they're saying is, we know you, we know where you're from, where was he from? Nazareth. Nazareth. But I've got a question. So there's no biblical reason that they were expecting not to know where he's from? Well, you have, so you have Malachi chapter three, which just kind of sounds like, like the Messiah will just kind of show up and do stuff. But, but remember, but remember, we, we know this from the Christmas, you all know this from the Christmas story, is that when they go to Herod and they say, where is the king of the Jews to be born? They don't say, I don't know. No, they know. They go to Micah. I can't write. It doesn't matter if we're live or online. Micah 5, right, verse 2 and following, it says that he's going to be born in, Jerusalem, in Bethlehem. So they know this. And as a matter of fact, this is actually later in the chapter, in John 7, uh, verse 42, they even talk about this. So they do know that he's supposed to be from Bethlehem. So that's why this is a little confusing, because even as they say, we're not supposed to know where you come from, they know that where he's supposed to come from. So this is just a little strange, um, and, and that's why this is a little difficult, and people kind of stumble around how to explain this. But I think what's actually going on is something a little simpler, and I think it's something we can all kind of relate to. Actually, not more than kind of. I think it's, it's actually one of our kind of hang-ups in, in our faith sometimes, is that, and, and I don't know, um, yeah, anyway, here we go. 
I'll just say it bluntly, and then you guys can, can fight me on it. Jesus is too human. Jesus is just too human, right? So this is part of the problem. We walk in there and say, Jesus is the son of God. And then people say, no, he's not. He's too human. He gets hungry. He thirsts. He's tired. There are certain things he doesn't know. He dies. I mean, how can he be the son of God if he dies? How can he be the son of God if the, if the Romans and the Jews actually have authority over him? He's too human. See, this Jesus is too human. As a matter of fact, this is a major movement in scholarship, and it just happens over and over and over and over, is that they're always trying to prove that Jesus isn't God at all. He's just a normal dude that the church made up to be God. Well, why? Because he's too human. He's just too human. It's for, for him to be the son of God, the eternal savior, the, the one sent from God to be the eternal son of God. He just seems to be way too human. As a matter of fact, he's like any Bible teacher. Half the time, he doesn't make any sense, right? You, you listen and you kind of go, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you're fancy. You're saying all these kind of it's fun stuff. But I don't know what you're talking about. Those are called the parables. We have no idea what he's talking about half the time right? He's just too human. And then other times say, no, 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 he's not too human. He's too divine, right? Well, if Jesus is supposed to be a guy, how can he walk on water? How can he know the thoughts of every single human being? How can he be eternal? How can he rise from the dead? That doesn't make, humans can't do those things. This is crazy. We're just making stuff up. And this is the problem is Jesus is always kind of either too human or too divine for our taste. And this is why some of you um, tuned in for First John on Tuesday nights. I think we're going to do that again, by the way. 7 o'clock Tuesday night, we'll do First John. We'll continue. Um, but this is why when we talk about Jesus, we always want to make sure we're talking about the one person, Jesus. I literally can't write today. One person, Jesus, with two natures. And what happens is you see people struggle whenever one of those natures becomes apparent, we struggle. And we say, well, it doesn't make sense for Jesus to be, I think the one that most people struggle with is, how can Jesus not know certain things? The disciples say, when's the second coming? And he says, I don't know. And we say, well, how can Jesus not know? He's, he's God. And then there's other times when he's just too divine. You know, he's supposed to be a normal guy growing up and all this kind of stuff, but it, when he's 12 years old, he already knows the Holy Scriptures, and he's able to teach the teachers in the temple. Is he really a, a normal person? Is he, a, is he fully human? And so this is always the struggle, and in this instance, they're saying to him, you can't be Messiah. <clears throat> you're too human. We know you. You're just a normal, ordinary guy. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions or thoughts on that? Hey, Kevin, you know. In yep, go ahead. This is a, a language. That word suddenly, where they maybe getting too hung up on that, or potentially that he'd just appear out of nowhere. Or yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the. That's what scholars think is that they're, they're kind of just going with that word suddenly and thinking that means that we'll have no idea until he actually fully appears. He'll just kind of out of the blue show up. And again, that's not really the full, the full testimony of the Old Testament even because there are places where we know him, where he grows up, right? I mean, you think about all the passage of Isaiah where he's pictured as a child growing up like a tender shoot, all these passages where there is um, idea that the Messiah will be a child and grow up in, in the midst of Israel. So I guess that's a good a good lesson about taking one word and putting too much weight on it. Yes, and and the other thing, and and this is we're all friends here, right? So this is the other thing is that is that I keep saying this, and, and the more I say it, the more I like it, I guess, because I keep saying it. But I think I think what you find out is that biblical interpretation, which is a fancy way to say when you read the Bible, right? Biblical interpretation is always struggling 
with the tension between metaphor and, and, and I don't like this word, but it's the easiest way to say it, literal, literal reality. Meaning, what's a symbol and what's, what's like true? Like what actually happened? What's symbolic and what's actually happening? And what we end up doing is that in all prophecy, we're always guessing. Okay, and I know this unsettles some people, just hang on, it's okay. And what you see is in the first coming of Jesus, they got these wrong mostly. Okay, they, they thought, oh, that prophecy is a metaphor. The Messiah isn't actually going to be born of a virgin because that's not physically possible. You know, that's a metaphor. So the virgin birth, they think, oh, that's metaphorical. And then they think, but sitting on David's throne and reigning in Jerusalem, oh, that one's got to be a literal reality. He's actually going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and reign over God's people. And what happens in those two things, obviously you know already, they get them totally backwards. The literal reality is he's literally born of a virgin. Like physically, it happens. And the metaphor is actually he's going to reign on David's throne right he doesn't actually sit on a throne in jerusalem at any point in his earthly ministry nor does he do it in any way shape or form until you know if you want to take the second coming but even that is not really david's throne that's god's throne um so metaphorically he does this on the cross that's when he's enthroned as king and so what we have is we're always struggling with this this question of is that a metaphor or is that real? And, and the reason I bring this up is we know the ones from the first coming because that's what the Bible tells us, right? That's the point of the four gospels. They explain to us what Jesus literally did and what he taught as metaphor. But the question for us now is the second coming. Which of the prophecies of the second coming are metaphorical and which ones are going to be literal? So we know, or we think, I guess, see, here's the point. No, yeah, how arrogant am I, right? So there's a pretty good guess that, that when Jesus says it's going to be a wedding feast, that that's a metaphor, because I doubt the entire Christian church is going to be, you know, kind of walking down the aisle and, you know, wearing a dress. But, but there's going to be a metaphorical wedding be between Jesus and his bride, the church. But... You know, there's some literal realities, like Jesus will return. It says in the book of Acts that he will come back just as he went up. So that seems to be a literal one. Um, it seems like the world will be destroyed physically and then rebuilt physically. But again, how do we understand these things, right? How do we understand them? What's the, which ones are which? And then this even gets hard for us as Christians in our daily life. How do we live this out? Which of the commands of God, which are the things in the scriptures, are metaphor for us of which ones are literal. This is always, this is the tension, right? When, when you guys read the Bible and someone says, well, I read it this way. What are you really talking about? You're saying, well, I think that one's metaphor. And someone else says, no, 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 no. I think that one's literal. Jesus says, sell everything you have and give to the poor. Well, some people have taken that literally. They've, they've said, well, it's the Christian duty to not possess things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell it all and give it to the poor. Other people said, oh, no, 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 that's a metaphor. That's, that's kind of how we're supposed to see our possessions. See? And, and all of a sudden, you've got these, these two competing realities of biblical interpretation. Well, this is why all with this discussion with Jesus is they're trying to figure out which of the Old Testament prophecies are metaphor about the coming Messiah and which ones are literal. And here's the thing. The answer to this question is this. It's the cross. You say, which one is informed by the death and resurrection of Jesus? Which one points here? And how does that teach us how to live? And this is what Jesus is going to drive the conversation to in John chapter 7. So the next question, number four, when will Jesus show who he is? And the answer, you guys know the answer. In John, it's always the cross. When I am lifted up, when I am lifted up from the earth, literally lifted up on the cross, exalted, 
then all people will see that I am he or that I am Yahweh. So the idea is that this actual act of death and resurrection will be the defining moment of Jesus as Messiah. This will be the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies, of all of God's actions. It will be in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Okay? So whatever signs you have, it's pointing toward that. Whatever teachings you have, it's pointing toward that. And, and now for us, we're, we're always reading stuff looking back to that. And that's exactly right, because that's the key moment. That's what God has done to save us. Okay? Any questions so far? Thoughts? I know that's a lot. But that's what happens when you're home all day thinking. Okay. Number five. Let's read. This is more fun. John 7 verses 32 through 36. Does somebody Kevin. Want to read for us? Yeah, I'll do that. Great. Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. And Jesus said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to he who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? Okay, thank you. John doesn't make it any easier, does he? He just keeps on making it weird. It's just so hard to understand what's going on here. So number, what are we on? Five, where is Jesus going? Where is he going? Where we can't go. Right, where we can't go. Okay? So where can't you go? Back to the Father. Back to the Father. Good. Okay, so he came, he came from the Father, and he's going to go back to the Father. Okay? Now, how does Jesus get back to the Father? What does he do? He must die. He's going to have to die. And this is the irony, is that, you know, on the cross is Jesus going to where he was before. This is this is the mission that he was sent for. And and what he's saying to the Jews is this isn't this isn't something you can do. You can't accomplish this. Right? Only Jesus can accomplish this. So he's going to go to the place where he alone can do this. Why can he alone do this? What's unique about Jesus? Because he's both human and divine. Because he's what? I'm sorry. He's both human and divine. Good. He's human and divine. So, so what about him makes him uniquely qualified to accomplish the salvation of the world? He's eternal. Yeah. He's without sin. Okay. He's eternal. He's without sin. He's sent from the Father. So he is going to go where only he can go. Remember, where is, the, where is the only place in all of the Old Testament that is exclusive to one person? The Holy of Holies. Good. Very good. The Holy of Holies is the place that only the high priest can go, and only he can go there once a year, because this is the place where God is. And remember, you can't, if a sinner approaches God, what happens? If a sinner approaches God, what happens? Sinner dies. Okay? So we don't want to do that. We can't go there. But when Jesus approaches the Father, what happens? The Father responds with grace, right? Grace to every sinner that Jesus represents. So when Jesus goes to the Father with his sacrifice, when he enters the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrifice, the Father receives that sacrifice and as a result has grace upon every person that Jesus represents. 
every person that's included in this action receives grace from the Father. Okay? This is actually what it means to believe in Jesus, right? To believe in Jesus means what he did on the cross. I don't even see all those lines. There's a cross in there somewhere. What he did on the cross, you're saying, I believe God is going to forgive my sins because of the action of Jesus. Okay? And the Jews can't accomplish that. The Jews can't get God in their favor, on their side, right? They can't do this. Nobody can do this. No sinner can do this. No, actually, we'll read the book of Hebrews even, is not even the high priest could ever even do this. Even when they went into the Holy of Holies, they had to go with the blood of a sacrifice. Otherwise, they themselves would be in trouble. And what we learn is that the, even the blood back in the Old Testament was actually the blood of Jesus that was doing this. The, the, the bulls and the goats and all that were simply a representative, going back to the other drawing, a metaphor, pushing us to the literal fulfillment of the blood, the literal blood that atones for sin. Okay, does that make sense? Kevin, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so were you, are you saying that God before Jesus, mm -hmm. before Jesus came down, or came, that God, if anybody approached God, that they die? Yep. Really? Yep. That's just it's like still true. Mind. So we, still he was true. not a forgiving God? Yeah, he was. This is That's exactly the whole point of, good, very good question. That's the whole point of the sacrificial system. The sacrificial system of the Old Testament. All those weird rules in Leviticus no one wants to read. All those regulations with how you do this and how you do that. It's, it's in order to ensure that an Israelite who sins doesn't approach God in such a way that they will die. Instead, God graciously says, well, you're a sinner, you can't approach me, so I'll give you a way through which your approach to me will not end in death, but will end up with my grace, okay? And what happens in the entire sacrificial system is there so that people who sin aren't apart from God anymore, that God will say, okay, here's a way that your sin will not result in death for you, but instead I'll have grace. I'll have grace through this system. And what happens is then you get the tabernacle and the priests and the sacrifices and the festivals and the offerings. And then, the, and then later you get temple and priests and courts and all these different things. And the whole idea is that for us to get to God, if we go there with our sins, we'll die. So God has put in place a system of sacrifices and priests and offerings and washings that will allow sinners into his presence without the result being death. And then what happened in the New Testament, this is what you're getting at, is now instead of a sacrificial system and a tabernacle and priests, we have God himself. We have God himself reconciling sinners to God. Okay? So God always had grace, even the Old Testament, but it was through the sacrificial system and the priests, but, but they were kind of temporary and, and weren't as good. That's actually what the book of Hebrews says. But now in Christ, God himself reconciles sinners to himself. That's, That's the much more world. sense. Okay? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. Even the high priest, once a year, they didn't they tie a rope around his foot? Yeah, so even the high priest, when they went to the Holy of Holies, they tied a rope around his foot and put bells on his robe, um, and he kind of kept moving. I, I'm, do not, I'm not trying to dance on camera, trust me. But he kind of kept moving, swishing his robe, so the bells would keep ringing, because if the, ring, if the ring stopped, they would pull him out by the rope because they thought he died. Because even the high priest did not dare enter God's presence without blood to cover his own sins as well as the sins of the people behind him, okay? So even, even the high priest going to the Holy of Holies did it in fear, abject fear, as in fear of death. And they had to pull, you know, if he died in there, they, nobody else could go in and get him. They had to pull him out by a rope. So 
even that picture, this is why the book of Hebrews says, we need a better priest than that, because that priest went in with their own sins. We need a priest who represents us before God without worrying about his own sins. See, you need somebody who can go before the Father and not say, accept me, you know, even though I'm a sinner. No, no, no. Your advocate goes before the Father and doesn't need to plead for himself at all because he's perfect. He's holy. Matter of fact, he's God. So all of his pleading then is on behalf of, of sinners. So that's where, and we keep going back to this verse, Second, um, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Okay? So all of the Old Testament is fulfilled in this mediation of Christ, this, this action of God to forgive sins. Okay? Number, wow, time is flying. So number six, where will people look for Jesus? In physical places, like around yeah. town? Yeah, in town, in, in the temple, probably, because he's a religious guy, so he's probably in the temple. Where else? I mean, that's physically where they're going to look for him, but, but kind of metaphorically where they're going to look for him. In the word, in the scriptures? Well, that's where we're going to look for him because we know the right answer. But they're actually going to look for him in signs, right? Signs and wonders and in the temple. And what they're really going to look for him if we're to be honest in all of this, is where they think he where they think he should be. Okay, so the people are going to look for Jesus where the the authorities think he should be and where they think he should be. Going back to the previous, let's see if I had buttons. I got the previous board, where the authorities and their own ideas line up and say this is where Messiah should be. This is where we're going to look for him. And what he's going to say is that you're going to look for me physically. You're going to look for me in Jerusalem. They're going to look for him in Jerusalem, but where is he actually going to be? Outside of Jerusalem, on a cross. They're going to be looking for him in Jerusalem, right? In the temple, in the holy place, where God and his priests belong. And instead, he's going to be outside Jerusalem on the place of the skull on a cross. And most people are going to miss it. Okay, so that's number seven, then where is Jesus? And that's what I think Scott was getting at there is where is Jesus for us? We find him in the word. Okay, we find Jesus in the word. And that word is always about the cross. And this is this is then how we learn to read the scriptures is we find Jesus in the scriptures because they're always pointing us to God's action. If you go back to the other drawing I had, God's action to save mankind through the cross. That's the narrative. So when you read Genesis, the narrative is, is, is God is acting to save his people. How is he going to do that? Through the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's always the narrative. And, and I know we're all kind of sitting at home in this weird reality of fear, and we don't even know what to be afraid of or if you should be afraid. We have no idea what's going on. And, and I submit to you that the narrative has not changed, that we're still supposed to be people whose lives are focused on God acting in Christ to save his people, that that is still the primary reality of our life. Even if we're trapped at home, even if, if whatever's going on, right, is that for us as Christians and our baptism, we are brought into this story of God saving us through his son. And that salvation is guaranteed, Okay. Remember, 1 John, the whole point of 1 John, at least the second half, is that your salvation is guaranteed because God's promises, I don't know why I'm writing so poorly today. God's promises are kept in Christ. You guys all know my, second, my favorite verse about this. 2 Corinthians 1.20, 
No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so they're ominous spoken to the glory of God. So we look for Jesus in the word that points us to the death and resurrection of Jesus so that we say, this is really our narrative. This is who we are. We are people whom God has loved so much that he sent his son. And, and because the Holy Spirit has, hey Tom, because the Holy Spirit has given us faith in this, then we are, are those who have eternal life, right? And then if you run into somebody who doesn't know this story, what do you do? You tell them, you share it with them, right? You, you share with them the word of God. You say, hey, there's, there's good news out there for you. This is, this is the reality, right? There's an eternal life. There's an eternal life that's guaranteed for you. And it, well, well, I'm not good enough, right? I'm, I'm one of those sinners that God should kill. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Me too. I'm guilty of sin. I deserve the wrath of God. But by God's grace, he gives me something different. Because of his promises, because of his steadfast love, because of his mercy, because of his grace, he gives us eternal life. Even those of us who don't believe it. Or, I mean, we do believe it. Don't deserve it. Okay? Any questions on that so far? I'm used to weird questions at this point at some point. Somebody's got to say something that makes it go on a tangent. Otherwise, we'll just keep going and then who knows what happens. All right. You guys online don't ask as many questions as you do in, in reality. Okay. So let's read John 7, verses 37 through 39. It's a short section. So I want to read that for us. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me and, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet glorified. Okay, good. So we talked about this a little bit at the beginning at the introduction. Why is this setting important for this? I mean, they're kind of cool words. You can kind of say them anytime, and it's kind of cool, right? There he comes to me, you know, I'll give him living water, and that's pretty cool. Um, out of his heart will flow living water. But why is the setting important? Remember, at the, at the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Feast of the Booths, there was this ceremony in which they poured water over the altar. And if you think about water in the Old Testament, remember, what? well, you tell me, what's some water stuff in the Old Testament? Water is always about a well. Okay, good. We got wells. And what's going to happen at wells? Marriage. Right, people get married. Good. What else? Blood. Okay, the flood. Genesis chapters 6 through 9, the flood, right? Noah and the flood. What else? Parting the waters. Good. The Red Sea and the Jordan, right? Both times the, the water is stopped or parted. What else? I have I, ceremonial washings and cleansings. Okay. You have ceremonial washings. So you have ceremonial water that cleanses somehow. Life, water in the desert when they were thirsty, they gave them life. Good. There's, there's the, the rock, so the water in the desert. Okay. You also have water at creation. Okay, remember in Genesis 1, the spirit hovers over the surface of the deep, over the waters. Okay, so you have spirit and water. Okay, and then remember Ezekiel. You have the great metaphor or the great picture of the river flowing from the throne of God in the middle of the temple. 
okay? So you have this great river from the throne of God in the temple. And that's, that's a big one. Um, that's a really important, well, remember, um, let's see. What was I going to say? I just totally blank. Anyway, Ezekiel is, a, is an important prophecy of the end times that the river will flow from the throne of God in the middle of the temple. Oh, I was going to say in today's, today's Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday in Lent is Ezekiel 37. That's not where the water is. It's in the 40s. Um, but in 37, you have this idea of the spirit of God, the breath of God gives life to God's people. So a lot of, a lot of talk with water giving life and water with the spirit. Okay. And that kind of reminds us, you go back then to John chapter 3, where you have water and spirit as the way to enter into the kingdom of God. Remember that? With Nicodemus. Okay, the only way to enter the kingdom of God is to be born of water and the spirit. Okay, and then in John chapter 4, We all know that story. That's the woman at the well. Okay. So then obviously you have the well and a marriage and, and all kinds of stuff in John chapter four. But also remember in John chapter four, with the living water, then Jesus says, whoever worships the Father, worship him in spirit and in truth. So again, you have spirit. So there's all these water and spirit references. And then if you turn in your Bible to John 19. John 19, which is the death of Christ. Okay, so in John 19, it's, that's the chapter that talks about the crucifixion. And you go to verse 34. So John 19, 34. You have this pouring out of water and blood, okay? Which obviously for us, we, we now know that, that water and blood, these are sacramental references, okay? Um, where we have from, the, from our Christ himself, he gives us the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, but in the Gospel of John, this water and blood that is kind of all this coming together in the person of Christ as God's Messiah for us. Okay. And then if you go to the next chapter, John chapter 20, just real quick, just so you see all this, how it, how it kind of plays out. John 20, 22. This is just the next chapter over. And, and when he had said this, he breathed, up, breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive everyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold their forgiveness, it is withheld. So again, you have this, this giving of the Spirit, which if you look at John 7, 39, had not yet been given because Jesus had been glorified, right? And that's a crucifixion reference. So after the death and resurrection of Jesus, one of the things he does is he gives the Spirit to the church, okay? So he's standing up here in the middle of this, of this festival where they're remembering all these Old Testament water events by pouring water on the altar. And he has the audacity to say to them, I'm going to give you real water. And the water that I give to you is actually the spirit. Okay. And if you want to look just real quick, just because they're having fun, go to Zeph Zechariah, not Zephaniah, but Zechariah. If you can find that quickly, you get a prize. It's one of the minor prophets from the very end of the Old Testament. So go back to Matthew, then just kind of start going backwards a little bit. You get Malachi and Zephaniah and Haggai and Zechariah that will be there. Okay? Go to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah. So not Zephaniah, but Zech Zechariah. 14, and we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. I think those are the right verses. I'm hoping. Well, maybe not. Maybe 6. 
actually, no, let's not do that. Let, we'll, we'll go the opposite way. Those, those will work too, but we're gonna do eight, eight to nine, just because we're running out of time here. Eight to nine. So Zechariah 14, eight to nine. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem. Half of them to Eastern Sea and half of them to Western Sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. Look at this. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So now we have this reference of Jesus and him saying, I'm this water that's flowing out, right? In John chapter 7, this water is flowing out. And he's in Jerusalem saying this. So there's an allusion back to this prophecy. Out of his heart, rivers of water, living water will flow. And it's kind of pointing back to this prophecy of Zechariah that in, this, in the end times, the day of the Lord, that God himself will reign as king and there'll be this, this flowing water in Jerusalem, which obviously goes back to the Ezekiel prophecy as well. Okay, so again, what we have, and I want you guys to miss this, is that Jesus is standing up and saying that he, that he is the fulfillment of all of this, that all of these things in the Old Testament, all of these things that you know about God, all of it, the entire Old Testament, everything you know about God, it's all fulfilled in Jesus. Okay? So all of this stuff that we've been trusting in God for is, is in Jesus. And, and I think for us today, that's still the message we need to hear, is that if you're wondering if God is still with you, if you're wondering if God is still faithful, if you're wondering if God is still God, look here. Look right here and see what Christ has done. And when you see the cross, you see God saying, I am your God. I love you. I forgive you. Death has been conquered. Life is yours. You're my child. Nothing can separate you from my love. This is a guarantee from God. It's a guarantee for you. And all who trust in this have eternal life. That's Jesus for you today. Okay, it looks like our time is about up. So any questions before we go? Anything that somebody wants to ask or... Kevin, I just wanted to say that this is the reason why Jesus is the only way. Exactly. There's no other way because he is the high priest who takes the blood sacrament that we're cleansed and made whole and perfect before the Father. So the, when people come up with any other religion, there's just no other way before God to see man holy, to enter his temple forever and ever, or to be right. with him forever and ever. That's exactly right. That's that you're exactly right. So one of the things this means is, is the exclusivity of this. Only Jesus fulfills yes. this. There, we can't make any other religions up because because it's it right. right. This doesn't point anywhere else, right? This doesn't point anywhere else. God doesn't point anywhere else. It's here. That's exactly right. Yep. Anything else? Kevin, yeah. I've been thinking this week, uh, when, when Christ says in my father's house are many mansions. Mm -hmm. John 14. Yeah, most of us want to think of that as actual physical dwellings. Is that actually Christ's righteousness that clothes us? Yeah, I, I, you've heard me say this before, but I truly believe, if you read this text, it says, believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house in many rooms. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told that I go, and I go to prepare a place for you. So where does he go? He goes to the cross. He doesn't go to heaven and start building houses. He goes to the cross. And what he says is, is that you're going to abide in me as I abide in the Father. So the, the, the heavenly dwellings of God is actually the very person of Jesus. And we, we live, we actually, and this is where the metaphor and literal come in, we live in God, in Christ. That's our dwelling. Okay. Now we will physically also live with God in paradise, but it's, he's not building a colonial style mansion for you. Right. He's not, he's not building a, a, a ranch dwelling for you. He's, he's building a, a home of righteousness 
He's building uh, an eternal dwelling with God that is actually better than any building you can conceive of or any metaphysical, metaphorical house that you could conceive of. So the primary place that we want to dwell is in Christ. So then you have the, the twist in Colossians 3, 16, where it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let me know. Dwell in you. Dwell in you, right? So then the way that we dwell in Christ is his word dwells in us, right? So the word dwells in us. And, and this is how we then receive this righteousness in which we live in God is the word of God dwells in us. Now, is there, can we use this in funerals and say, yeah, you know, we're all looking forward to our heavenly home. Can you use that? Well, yeah, because when you're, when Christ returns, you will dwell eternally with God because of the dwelling that you have in Christ now. Right. Right. So yeah, it's not one or to other. It's, it's kind of the complete picture. But yeah, the, I think the primary reference in John 14 is the actual righteousness of Christ that's given to us on the cross. That's right. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Okay, well, I... I Right. I just wanted to mention the exclusivity is, is somewhat what people have issues with because I'm having discussions with my cousin and he's like, well, there's hundreds of beliefs out there, many ways to God. And the exclusivity is really the most important aspect. It, you're exactly right. It's the hardest thing and in some ways the most important thing because... And I know you can't solve this problem quickly, but but the the confession that there there exists a God actually at the same time confesses that that means that God is the only one who has the right to tell us how to access Him or who He is. And so if we start saying, well, humans have admitted hundreds of ways to God, and therefore they must all be kind of equally true or given equal weight then you're kind of saying there isn't really a God because the, the existence of an actual God would actually lend itself to the idea that this God, this divine being, is the one who gets to call the shots. We don't get to. If humans are able to make up religions and God has to say, well, they're all okay, well, then he's no longer much of a God. We're actually God, and he's capitulating to our desires. So I think even the idea that there is a God kind of lends itself to the idea that that God is going to tell us how things are supposed to go, right? That that's important for morality, that if there's a God, that God actually gets to determine right and wrong. We don't. If, if we determine right and wrong, then we're God. If, if, and, and that's most especially true in religion. If, if God must accept any religion that humans come up with, well, then he's not much of a God. He's just simply a nice idea that we can all agree upon. But that's not really a God. That's just human ideas. So what I, what I encourage people to talk about is anything that you want to say about God. If you want to say, well, you know, God is loving. Then you kind of say, where did you learn that? Where do you learn about God as a loving God? Why would we assume that? There's nothing in my life looking around right now that says God is loving. As a matter of fact, everything in our life say that God is totally out of control. He has no idea what's going on because some little germ means I can't see you guys and have a donut, right? This is stupid, but you, you can't, you can't do that. You can't play the, the, the game of inventing gods based on our perceptions. So what you do is you start talking about God in these terms, like, well, he's good. Well, is he good? Meaning he lives up to my idea of good, or does he actually teach me what goodness is? And that's, and that's what happens is we start saying, well, it makes sense that if God is good, then he's teaching goodness. If God is love, then he's showing love. And the question is, how does God do that? And the answer is here. He, he tells us that this is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. This is love. Not that we love God, 
but that God loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Okay. So that's, that's kind of how we want to enter into those conversations is that when people say anything about God, we kind of want to help them look at where did you learn that about him? Where did you learn that God is loving? Where did you learn that God is good? Where did you learn that God is gracious? Where did you learn that this world should be ordered? Well, we learn that in God revealing himself to us. And then you say, well, where do you find God? Right? Where does he reveal himself? And what we have is this, the, the Holy Scriptures is, is the book that has always been, whether anybody likes it or not, it's the one book that's always been looked at as sacred text. Other books have come along afterwards or tried to imitate them, but this is the scriptures that have always revealed to us who God is in Christ. And the story is unique because in the Bible, God is the one who solves it, the problem, not us, right? So we keep pointing to that. Okay, any other quick questions? Well, I really appreciate all your attention. I appreciate you guys hanging in there with me. Um, this was, I hope it was a, a blessing to you. It was, it was certainly fun. Um, and I, I will try to get this recorded. It, it's supposed to be recording. I will try to get the, the recording edited and up online as soon as possible if you want to share with your friends. And I guess we'll keep doing this until we can physically see each other again. So let's pray and then we'll go. Can I make, can I make a comment? Yes. So, hi, um, it's Tom. Um, were you saying that like um, people who don't know God don't know like the attributes of God, like love, and how do you know that there's a gracious God? I do know a lot of people though who don't believe in God who are very, very awesome and like humanists loving people. And yeah, I know, good. I really do. So That's I just wanted to challenge oh. that. People can't learn about God without like the Bible or, or anything like that. And I know you could probably get into um, the left, like the, what you call it, the left God's hand, grace. Right yeah. The left hand, right hand kingdom and the natural revelation and how like people's righteousness is not righteousness unless they, you know, mm -hmm. are, if, unless it's in Jesus, but I don't know. Another thing that might be helpful is to think about what you'd think about C.S. Lewis in the last battle writing about Tash, the guy who was seeking Tash and who um, Aslan was like, you were seeking me all along and just right. a different name or something. I don't know. Maybe that goes against the well laid out things in the formula of Concord and like all those doctrines. But, you know, I understand. I just wanted to bring that up that I've been experiencing a lot of love and God through people who don't necessarily believe what we believe. And if you have a if that's a something you wanted to explore or, or whatnot. I, well, I think I think you bring up something that's very important. And and the results of, of God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself is that in Christ, God so loves the world. World. Whether that world loves him back or not, right? God loves the world. And what that means is he gives his gifts to the world, including those who don't believe in him. And what God's promise is, is that he will work his love in this world, even those who don't believe in him, to bless his people. So yeah, there will be lots of atheists, non-Christians, whatever, who, who experience true love and actually do learn to love. There will be a lot of atheists or non-Christians that live moral and decent lives. And we would say, yeah, they're moral and decent lives. Now, they're not salvific because they don't believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. But they are morally decent people. They are loving people. And why? Because God in Christ loves this world. And remember, God's grace is not contingent upon our response. God doesn't say, I'll love you if you love me back. No, he loves simply because he loves, including those who don't believe in him. Don't, don't forget this. This is, Tom, you bring a very good and important point. God loves people. That's how it starts. It doesn't start with the people who love God and God says, okay, great, I'll love you too. No, it's God's love for everybody. That's what this, that's what the cross is. It's God's love for the world. So yeah, you're exactly right. There'll be a lot of people you'll encounter 
I mean, this is bringing it out. A lot of non-Christians are doing wonderful things to help their, their neighbor, right? A lot of wonderful things are being are happening through very secular means that are a blessing. Mm -hmm. And what do we say? We say, yeah, that's because God in Christ loves the world and he's blessing us through all of this. He'll work even through non-believers, right? He does it all the time. That's kind of how we exist. I, I mean, I know everyone in Kansas is a Christian, but but just pretending there is someone in, in Kansas that isn't, <laughs> the, the wheat they grow will still bless me when it turns into bread at Aldi, right? I don't say I'm only going to drive on roads that were paved by Christians to get to church when we can go back. No, God works through all people to bless the world. So yeah, you're exactly right, Tom. There'll be a lot, you'll see a lot of these qualities in people who don't know this. What we're getting at is that they're missing the grace that is specifically in Christ and then the promise of eternal life. Okay. And that's what we want to bring to them with the gospel is that there's good news that they're not aware of. And we want to show them that that is eternal life. Right, right, right. And I think that I hope at least that the love part is more important to Jesus than the correct belief or like that, that missing knowledge or whatever that could save them. And, it is hard for me to think that that Jesus would, you know, express his love to people by sending them to hell. I don't know. I've heard of the thing like that hell is God's love, but a certain side of God's love. I don't know. Like that's kind of a scary God to me that, yeah. that would be really yeah, particular what? about making sure people believe, um, have the right faith or something. And then, you know, having an eternal consequence for, for being on the sort of wrong side of that and, especially when God's love is being shown to me through all these, these people. And so, you know, that's something I, I'd like to grapple with, with you and with, you know, everyone else on. And Absolutely. Cause you know, God has is ju a just God and, and stuff like that. And so there's, there's that, I, but yeah, if you, if, if you have the time and want to, you can speak, say a few words to that. I don't want to like drag it out or anything. Just, just kind of curious. I think that, you know, the real, the real focus of scripture and what we're going to keep focusing on is, is just drive people to what God has done in Christ and let that be, let that be what wins is, is God right. in Christ to love the world. That's, that's kind of it. And yeah, I'm, we do need to go, but, but you're right. It's not, and I do want to say this because you mentioned it. I want to make sure that this is said too, is that I'm not saying, nor would anybody else who, who, who understands this, that correct doctrine saves us. It doesn't. Correct doctrine is not what, what earns me favor before God. It's actually God's action in Christ. And, and that's where our faith is. So, yeah, I really appreciate those comments. It's really good, Tom. I appreciate, I always appreciate your insights. It's very Thank helpful. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, that's it. All right, well, let's pray. I got to get going. I actually have, um, yeah, I got to get going right now. But let's pray, and then we'll hopefully meet again next week. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time to come together around your word, especially the word found in John. We pray that you would turn our hearts always to your love for us in Christ, that even in, in the situations we face right now, that we would know that you are a God who loves us and who holds us close to yourself, who forgives our sins and gives us eternal life. Let us be witnesses of that love to our neighbors and those that we interact with in whatever way that's possible these days. And Lord, we look forward to the day we can gather again together as your church physically in one place to rejoice in the, the gifts and the benefits of being together. But until that day, Lord, keep us in the one true faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you sincerely. Thank you so much to everybody who, who logged on. What a blessing yeah. it is. Thank, Kevin. You. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. Thanks, Kev. Thank You're welcome. You. Loved it. Thanks.